Eh, allora, quindi prima di iniziare vi ricordo che eh, come sempre per i frammenti eh, la lezione a cui oggi pomeriggio assistiamo sarà registrata e pubblicata sui canali social dell'istituto, quindi invitiamo gli studenti a tenere le telecamere spente se possibile e ricordiamo ai docenti interni che hanno autorizzato già all'uso delle immagini. Per gli esterni invece la telecamera accesa e l'eventuale intervento audio saranno considerati esplicita autorizzazione. Ecco, con questa formula abbiamo quindi la nostra la registrazione di questo incontro e cedo la parola al dirigente Luigi Frati che ci saluta. Allora, buon pomeriggio a tutti e grazie delle numerose partecipazioni che aumentano sempre di più. Questo testimonia il valore di questa rassegna, io la chiamo, perché una rassegna non è solo un progetto scolastico. Infatti... L'importanza di questa rassegna viene testimoniata dal fatto che la professoressa Sonia Mosconi oggi ci aiuterà a comprendere un altro argomento molto importante. La professoressa Mosconi, io devo dire che è un valore aggiunto per il Galilei, perché noi parliamo sempre di figure di sistema, di commissioni, di funzioni strumentali, di staff, e tutto ciò ha ragione di essere grazie ai docenti, perché la scuola, non dimentichiamoci, la fanno i docenti, la fanno gli studenti, la fa il dietro le quinte e la professoressa Mosconi contribuisce attraverso una formazione di altissimo livello culturale, linguistico, all'ottenimento dei risultati che tutti noi vediamo. Se i ragazzi escono da qua con questa preparazione, se va, affrontano l'università senza problemi, se partecipano ai progetti di mobilità, è grazie al dietro le quinte. E la certificazione linguistica, i corsi di formazione per il personale che la professoressa sta facendo, no? per il personale ATA, per i docenti, quindi io ringrazio la professoressa Mosconi di questo valore aggiunto perché è proprio attraverso, nel silenzio no? che si contribuisce a seminare e troppo spesso non ce lo diciamo perché troppo spesso sbandieriamo i risultati, ah, oggi abbiamo ottenuto l'accreditamento che è importantissimo, lo stesso, però ecco io ci tenevo a sottolineare il valore dei docenti e ringrazio la professoressa Mosconi per il suo contributo. Buon lavoro. Grazie. E Sonia Mosconi, io, Chiara Pasquinelli, Stefania Schiavoni, Laria Sebastianelli, tutto il gruppo dei frammenti e anche il Dipartimento di Lettere, ti ringraziamo a nostra volta. Eh, ricordo per i colleghi o gli studenti che non ci hanno seguito fino ad ora che eh, la lezione di oggi pomeriggio si inserisce all'interno di questo eh, percorso. Ha ragione il dirigente, è una rassegna e eh, da alcuni anni... Eh, aspira ad essere una sorta di piccolo festival, ora lo stiamo celebrando eh, a distanza ma eh, dal 2018-2019 i frammenti del Novecento sono diventati F9 Lab e vogliono, vogliono essere eh, questa piccola rassegna, questo piccolo festival in cui vari eh, linguaggi dialogano eh, tra loro e dal 2018-2019 in particolare dedicati alla questione di genere. Um, la lezione di oggi pomeriggio di Sonia Mosconi si inserisce perfettamente eh, in questo percorso, nel percorso che è partito dalle fughe, quindi dai movimenti eh, from to, um, in, questo, in questo percorso eh, un aspetto eh, particolare appunto oggi sarà dedicato, un'attenzione particolare sarà eh, dedicata alla letteratura inglese e eh, al contributo che la letteratura eh, inglese ha dato eh, nel percorso anche di acquisizione di consapevolezza eh, da parte della letteratura eh, femminile. Eh, ti ringrazio Sonia, ti ascoltiamo, vi auguro buon ascolto, buona visione e eh, vi ricordo eh, che eh, il prossimo appuntamento sarà in parte in presenza, eh, sarà il nostro primo appuntamento dedicato prioritariamente eh, agli insegnanti, un seminario di aggiornamento eh, dedicato appunto ai docenti di scuola secondaria e in parte in presenza perché ci sono alcuni posti che potranno essere prenotati attraverso il nostro sito alla galleria di Palazzo Pianetti e sarà con la professoressa Paola Rocchi, ehm, il titolo dell'intervento è Voci femminili nella letteratura contemporanea sull'emigrazione. Vi auguro buon ascolto e poi 
ci rivediamo alla fine. Ok, thank you, let's start. Good afternoon everyone. First of all I want to thank my colleagues for giving me this opportunity to express myself. Okay, and now I'm going to be sharing my presentation. Right. Okay, it should be there. Can you see? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, let's start. So today we're going to be dealing with five outstanding authors, uh, writers, most of them, some of them poetesses too, all of them women. My lesson is stitched uh, together by a single thread that unites all five women authors, the issue of gender equality. These writers contribute five different ways uh, of looking into the same issue. issue. Five angles, uh, five viewpoints, and multiple reflections and ideas. I'd like to start from my initial quote, um, most of history, Anonymous was a woman. This famous quote by Virginia Woolf refers to the widespread habit of women writers of the past of omitting their names, their signatures from books or essays or poems they'd written for fear of attracting disapproval. It wasn't appropriate for a woman to write, even less to publish a work least of all to acknowledge that she had written through putting a name on it. It would have been shameful or insolent or even defiant. In this way, for centuries, women have been pushed and conditioned to silence, right? I'll repeat it, silence, because they were anonymous. They had to be anonymous. However, the verb in this quote is in the past, Anonymous was a woman, and so it means it's over. Women have a voice now. Well, surely they're looking for one. <laughs> so today, we're going to be hearing women's voices, great women's voices, about the uh, subtitle, okay, for which we have to go back, A Short Journey Through Feminist Literature in English. This lesson is a journey because it moves from to, as in the title of this present edition of uh, Frammenti dal Novecento, from an author to another, from a perspective to another. And each writer moves from a concept to some other concept, uh, some progress or some regress. This is a journey in time too. It will be roughly chronological and in space as as it will include women writers from three continents. The picture is by no means complete, of course. It's impossible to have it complete. I could have included many, other, many others. However, the ones I've chosen are, in my opinion, doubtlessly formidable. Let's move on a bit. The title, I believe, goes without explanation. It needs no comment for now. I'll take it up again at the end of the journey. I've chosen purple for my presentation, as purple and its shades have been the color of feminism for some time, actually since 1908. Um, it stands for justice, dignity, achievements gained, and achievements yet to come. Okay, so it gives us hope as well. The authors I've chosen are Virginia Woolf, Angela Carter, Margaret Atwood, Warson Shire, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adikie. Before starting, let's agree on a definition of feminism. Feminism is the belief in the political economic and social equality of the sexes, right? So I'll repeat it. The belief in the political, economic and social equality of the sexes, equality. 
Um, however, needless to say, there is almost no trace of equality between the sexes around the globe. The social hierarchy is indisputably topped by men. Quoting, as you can see, a Nigerian Nobel Prize laureate, we can see that the higher you go, the fewer women you find, right? So the higher you go in society, in business, in politics, everywhere, the fewer women you find. And so the world is ruled by men. The world is undoubtedly a patriarchy. Another definition here, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the patriarchy is a family or group or a government controlled by a man or a group of men. The patriarchy is our male-dominated society, right? Scusa, Sonia, ti interrompo. Sonia doesn't go on. Stop. The presentation no. is uh, stopped. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, se sei andata avanti rispetto alla prima, sì. Uh, uh, yes, I've gone on. Uh, puoi okay. mettere la modalità presentazione e poi... Ah, ok. I'll share again, I'll start a new. So you haven't seen the slide uh, with... Um, nothing, we have, we have seen nothing. Nothing? Just the, just the first, with the title. Uh, okay. Only the first one. Can you see now? Always the first one. Only the first one. Can you see the second now? No. Uh, Prova a mettere, uh, dunque, uh, la modalità presentazione uh -huh. è quella che... È... Ah, ecco, adesso sì. Adesso sei alla seconda. Uh, okay, and so uh, I won't put the presentation mode, okay? I will leave this one, uh, if it's better. Esatto. If it's better. Però, well, anyway. Eh, aspetta, scusa un attimo. Mm, io vedo ancora non la modalità presentazione, ma il format di... Yes, I'll leave this one, if it's okay. Okay. Right? Uh, or maybe we can try, uh, I don't know. Can you see now? Not yet. What can you see now? Uh, the second. The second, okay, so we are there. <laughs> right, for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. Can you remember women, uh, voiceless? Uh, okay, now, can you see number three? The five authors? No. Uh, manda avanti tu, Sonia. Clicca sulla terza diapositiva. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm going on. Ah, eh, in, in, in basso a destra tu hai eh, a, accanto al, eh, alla graduazione eh, della grandezza, appunto, alla sinistra hai la modalità, il tastino della modalità presentazione. Non sei, non hai avviato quella. Yes. Noi vediamo... Eh, dunque, non in Meet, ma nel PowerPoint. La presentazione del PowerPoint. Nella, la, uh, yes, eh, I've done it. Nel... I've done eh. it. Allora, vuoi oh, che... No. Ok. Che ti Now, uh, I've done it. Can you see it? Adesso sta andando. Sì, la terza. Vediamo la terza. Sì, però... Evidentemente non, non riesce a... No, I've got the second. It's not uploading, I believe. What should I do? Yes. What can you see? Um, che cos'è? We see the third one. The third one. Uh, for most of history, Anonymous was a woman. That's no, one. We saw, we see overview. 
of a view. Uh, okay, well, we don't go together. <laughs> we don't Very go good. together. <laughs> okay, well, can you see now? Can you see feminism uh, and patriarchy? Overview. Okay, maybe if we wait a second, uh, it will come. Always the same? Oh, always. Overview. Oh, no. Okay, and now what can you see? The higher you go, the fewer women. Oh, uh, okay. I leave it like this without presentation, right? Okay? Okay. So we said, let's agree on a definition of feminism. Uh, which is the belief in the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Uh, while the world, the higher you go, the fewer women you find, and so the world is ruled by men. Okay, the world is a patriarchy, which is a family, group, or government controlled by a man or a group of men. Right? The patriarchy, in other words, is our male dominated society. Now, multiple obstacles stand in the way of gender equality. Discrimination occurs at work, a pay gap, underemployment of women, and job insecurity are just some of the shapes it takes. Discrimination appears in access to education and in politics too. Very literally, as I said above, men rule the world. Moreover, what little had been done towards bridging the gender gap has been undone, lost, due to the present pandemic, which has made already insecure jobs even more insecure, which has brought about a huge increase in gender violence, domestic and otherwise. So, the pandemic. Enormous backward steps. Across the world, women have been obliged to bear the brunt of the pandemic and its socio-economic side effects. Also, as if the pandemic weren't enough, several conflicts together with the resurgence of dormant authoritarian regimes have deprived women of their chance to get an education and utterly stripped them of their every human right. To make matters worse, another pervading, unrelenting crisis, an ever more complex catastrophe, has been holding back progress for women and slowing down progress for humanity for many years. The, I'm talking about the global refugee crisis and its terrible implications. As a consequence, goal number five of the 2030 Agenda achieve gender equality and empower women and girls is getting remote, it's waning, fading away, its implementation being in a very dismal state. Thus, now more than ever, we need to start moving forward again. We need to patch up what damage has been done, embrace the instances of gender equality. It is essential to break free from the prison house of stereotypes and biases. We need to move away from the margins to reach center stage. Right? Can you see the, the next one? From the margins to center stage? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in this way, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, but how do we begin to do that? According to Virginia Woolf, the celebrated English modernist writer, writer, there are some prerequisites, some unavoidable assets any woman needs to start from. In A Room of One's Own, the essay published in 1929, now a classic work of feminist writing, Woolf tries to understand and analyze the reasons for the absence of great female writers in the English literary tradition. So the question is, why are there so few women writers when there are, there, ha there have always been, so many great uh, men writers? This near absence of creative work uh, by women was traditionally attributed to women's uh, inferiority and lack of talent, naturally. It goes without saying, 
Virginia Woolf totally disagrees, and many of us do. <laughs> Through Mary, the narrator in the essay, Woolf argues that the shelves of the British Library that should have been full of women's creative works aren't because throughout the centuries women have suffered educational, social, legal and political disadvantages that have prevented them from developing and expressing their talents. Women's inner lives have often been at odds with their external lives. At the time she wrote the essay, which was 1929, there were limitations to education for women in England. Access to university was limited and rare. The privilege of holding property was only for married women. So only a married woman could hold property. Wolf herself did not attend university. A woman, Virginia Woolf writes, must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. Okay, so this is the quote, really famous. These are, according to Woolf, the essential conditions for a woman to be able to create art, right? So some money and a room. All this um, has, you know, metaphorical meanings too. The room refers to both mental and physical space, mental and physical. Mental space means leisure, the opportunity to reflect, to develop ideas, to cultivate an inner life. It's fundamental for an artist. A physical space means privacy not being bothered by the cares and chores of everyday life. Also money, a woman needs money, some financial security, a measure of economic independence acquired through work, of course. Writing, creating requires time and tranquility. But no, it wasn't possible for a woman. That that much was denied in most cases. No room, no money, means no art, though the talent is there. So even if there is talent, no creation. Wolf produces a most clear il illustration of her point. She conjures up, so she invents, a Judith Shakespeare, Shakespeare sister to the incomparable William. We are talking about the 16th century, okay? So she invents a sister that Shakespeare never had called Judith with some characteristics. Mary, the narrator in the essay reflects, what if Shakespeare had had a sister? What would have li her life have been like? The fictional Judith, who is just as talented as her prodigi prodigious brother, serves as a practical example of what did happen and what might still happen to a woman's talents. Let's hear Judith's story directly from the pages of Virginia Woolf. Okay, and now I'm going to, to read. Remember, it's the second half of the 16th uh, century. Okay. Um, William got a formal education, uh, uh, thou cut short. Then he got married. Then he moved to London uh, to seek his fortune in, in the theatre. Thanks to his genius, uh, he quickly became uh, successful. Okay, so this is a short summary of what he said before. And now I'm going to read. Meanwhile, his extraordinarily gifted sister, let us suppose, remained at home. Right, so Judith stayed at home and she was gifted, talented. She was as adventurous, as imaginative, as a god to see the world as he was. But she was not sent to school. She had no chance of learning grammar and logic, let alone of reading Horace and Virgil. She picked up a book now and then, one of her brothers perhaps, and read a few pages. But then her parents came in and told her to mend the stockings or mind the stew 
and not moon about with books and papers, uh, right? So the, there was always someone reminding her that she was a woman, she had to look after the house. Perhaps she scribbled, so she wrote some pages up in an apple loft on the sly, right? Hidden, but was careful to hide them or set fire to them. Soon, however, before she was out of her teens, she was to be betrothed. She was to get engaged to the son of a neighboring wool sta stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, so she didn't want to get married. And for that, she was severely beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her. He prayed her not to hurt him, not to shame him in this matter of her marriage. How could she disobey him? How could she break his heart? The force of her own gift alone drove her to it. So she was too talented to, to get married and renounce, give up everything. She made up a small parcel of her belongings, let herself down by a rope one summer's night and took the road to London. Okay, so she went away exactly as uh, William had done. She was not yet 17. The birds that sang in the edge were not more musical than she was. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like her brother's for the tune of words. Like him, she had a taste for the theater. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Okay, so she went to a theater and asked for a job. Men laughed in her face. The manager, a fat, loose-lipped man, guffawed, right? He was very mocking. He pulled a leg. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting, right? So he was scornful. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, uh, you can imagine what. She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek a dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at night? No, of course not. A woman could, could never do that. Yet her genius was for fiction and lasted to feed abundantly upon the lives of men and women and the study of their ways. At last, for she was very young, oddly like Shakespeare, the poet uh, in her face, with the same gray eyes and rounded brows. At last, Nick Green, the actor manager, took pity on her. She found herself with child. Okay, so she got pregnant by that gentleman. And so killed herself one winter's night and lies buried at some crossroads uh, where the omnibus, omnibuses now stop outside the elephant and castle. That, more or less, is how the story would run, I think, if a woman in Shakespeare's day had had Shakespeare's genius, right? So this would have been the outcome. Inglorious death, right? She committed suicide because no one would have wanted her back, not even her family, now that she was pregnant. So, two parallel lives, William and Judith. But the ending, so different. For William, it was immortality, right? We are studying him now. Immortality. For Judith, it was the silence of death. Really different destiny. The talent was the same, but talent is not enough. Throughout history, women have been deprived of material means and legal freedom. They've been excluded from participation in public life and rendered dependent on men for financial security. They've been denied their right to education. They've been silenced and trapped in the home. No matter what social class they belonged to, it was the same for aristocratic women or middle-class women. They've been given no opportunities. They've been marginalized 
by a male-centered and male-dominated society. Judith Shakespeare is the metaphor through which Virginia Woolf shows the displacement of women from literature and the arts. Actually, not only literature and the arts, actually from nearly any field of uh, human activity, with just a few known exceptions, of course. Woolf supports the right of women to be emotionally and economically independent. In other words, the necessity for real emancipation. Education, she maintains, is no doubt the key. Actually, the key to human emancipation in general, right? Not only for women. Different, differently from William, Judith was not able to express her genius. And now a reflection. Think of all the talent all the ideas we've been missing out uh, over time. Think of all that we have lost through the repression of women's intelligence. The achievements, all the contributions in every field of human knowledge. It's positively a crime to kill someone's talent. Our world could have been radically different History could have been something else, for better or for worse. Who knows? If only women had had the chance to express themselves. That's why we need to go from the margins to center stage, as I said at the beginning. The same stage that Judith couldn't walk on. Okay. Now, Let's move. Let's move on to the domain of magic realism, gothic and fairy tales, to explore a really original undertaking, a really original project. I'm talking about The Werewolf by Angela Carter that uh, was collected in The Bloody Chamber. This project was carried out by Angela Carter, an English writer whose reach sensual language and astonishing imagination will stay beyond her too brief life. Um, Angela Carter's journey starts from the roots of Western culture. Um, fairy tales, folklore, myths uh, are embedded in our culture. They make up the foundation, together with the Bible, obviously, of our mindset, our values, uh, and the ideas that pervade everyday life. Our language is full of them. There are plenty of references, uh, quotes uh, from fairy tales, folklore, and other tales. Throughout the centuries, uh, fables and fairy tales have presented a stereotyped image of girls and women. Okay, so stereotyped image. In Cinderella, for example, Snow White, uh, etc. Women and girls have been described as either ma malignant uh, and malevolent, <laughs> think of the witches uh, in the fairy tales I mentioned, or weak, meek, dependent, uh, obedient, <laughs> silent, compliant, submissive, resourceless, defenseless, naive, <laughs> sweet, ornamental even and the list could go on indefinitely. This is what Angela Carter lamented, complained about, and this is what she set about to change when she embarked on the writing of The Bloody Chamber, a collection of short stories published in 1979. Her self-appointed task was, as I said, to go back to the roots of culture and eradicate, uproot, the said stereotype, stereotyped images of girls and women. She wanted to deconstruct, and she did deconstruct, the fairy tales of the Northern tradition to rewrite them from a feminist point of view. So this is the key, deconstruct the fairy tales, right? And rewrite them from a feminist point of view, from another point of view, a different one. 
Her intention was to demythologize, destroy, shatter the myths. Uh, the stale ideas comprised in the patriarchal viewpoint, because these tales represent the patriarchal viewpoint. She wanted to eradicate uh, the unchanging labels that have been attached to female human beings for far too long. She did this by turning the passive, unassertive girls into active, resourceful, powerful ones. What she ended up doing was a process of substitution and empowerment. Among the many tales in the collection, I've chosen to talk about a tale both familiar and strange, the werewolf. Familiar because it is a rescript of Little Red Riding Hood, you know, Capuchetto Rosso, right? Strange because it becomes something else, right? It becomes something completely different. For the sake of precision, precision uh, Little Red Riding Hood was written by Perrault in 1697, then rewritten by the Green Brothers in, in the 1850s. Um, now, everybody knows uh, Little Red Riding Hood. The little girl is asked to take a basket of food to her grandma, who is not well. Advised by her mother not to go through the forest, as a terrible wolf lives there who could eat her. The girl, distracted by the attractions of the flora, forgets about her mother's advice and walks right into the wood into the forest where, inexorably, the wolf shows up. The two end up into grandma's house where the wolf eats both the woman and the girl. Only with the help of the hunter, a man, will justice be done. The wolf killed and the two female characters restored to health, saved. Never disobey is the moral of the story, right? And now to Angela Carter's rescript. The new tale is set in a bone chilling, cold, scary, superstitious northern country. Gothic is the atmosphere, menacing and sombre. Uh, okay, there is a, um, an introduction to um, the fairy tale, okay? And uh, now I'm going to read this part, which goes uh, to the fact. Uh, to sum up, uh, right, I'm going to read. Winter and cold weather, right? This is a setting, cold, uh, winter and cold weather. Go and visit grandmother who has been sick. Take her the oat cakes I baked for her on the hearthstone and a little pot of butter. So this is the mother talking to the child. A good child does as, as a, her mother bids, five miles trudge through the forest. Do not leave the path because of the bears, the wild boar, the starving wolves. Here, take your father's hunting knife. You know how to use it, right? So the mother gives the child a hunting knife. And the child knows how to use it. The child had a scabby coat of sheepskin to keep out the cold. She knew the forest too well to fear it, but she must always be on her guard. When she heard the freezing howl of a wolf, she dropped her gifts, seized a knife and turned on the beast. Right? So the wolf, the werewolf, appears okay but the child is ready it was a huge one with red eyes and running grizzled chops any but a mountaineer's child would have died of fright of fear at the sight of it it went for her throat so the werewolf attacks as wolves do but she made a great swipe at it with her father's knife and slashed off it's right for Paul, let's say it's leg, right? So the, the child cuts 
the werewolf's leg. The wolf let out a gulp, almost a sob, when it saw what had happened to it. Wolves are less brave than they seem. It went lolloping off disconsolately between the trees, as well as it could on three legs, leaving a trail of blood behind it. The child wiped the blade of her knife clean on her apron. So the child has finished. She has uh, defended herself from, from the werewolf, wrapped up the wolf's paw. Okay, so she is prudent. She takes the wolf's paw in the cloth in which her mother had packed the oat cakes and went on towards her grandmother's house. Soon it came on to snow so thickly that the path and any footsteps, track or spore that might have been upon it were obscured. She found her grandmother was so sick she had taken to her bed and fallen into a fretful sleep, moaning and shaking so that the child guessed she had a fever. She felt the forehead, it burned. She shook out the cloth from her basket to use it to make the, the old woman a cold compress and the wolf's paw fell to the floor, right? But it was no longer a wolf's paw. It was a hand chopped off at the wrist. Okay, so it turns out that the wolf's paw is actually a hand, a hand toughened with work and freckled with old age. There was a wedding ring on the third finger and a wart on the index finger. By the wart, he knew it for her grandmother's hand. So it wasn't a wolf's paw, it was her grandmother's hand. Terrible. She pulled back the sheet. But the old woman woke up at that and began to struggle, squawking and shrieking like a thing possessed. But the child was strong and armed with her father's hunting knife. She managed to hold her grandmother down long enough to see the cause of her fever. There was a bloody stump where her right hand should have been festering already, so the grandma was missing a hand. It was really her hand. The child crossed herself and cried out so loud the neighbors heard her and came rushing in. They knew the wart on the hand at once for a witch's nipple. They drove the old woman in her shift as she was out into the snow with sticks beating her old carcass as far as the edge of the forest and pelted her with stones until she fell down dead. Okay, so uh, the girl together with the neighbors killed the grandma, murdered the grandma. Now the child lived in her grandmother's house. She prospered. So to sum up, what we, we have just uh, read. The child knows how to use a grandfather's knife. She's not scared of the forest. The wolf, a werewolf. So man and wolf together shows up. He's not weak enough though. The child is quicker and slashes his forepaw. The werewolf quits the scene. Now the child reaches a grandma who is feverish. She's got a temperature, she's feeling very bad in bed. She soon finds out that the reason for the fever is the infection resulting from a hand being cut off. The child realizes the werewolf was actually her grandmother. I'll repeat this. The werewolf was a grandmother trying to murder her, trying to kill her. It is the child now, with the help of the neighbors, that kills the old woman, recognized as a witch, by stoning her to death. Eventually, the child moves into her grandma's house. Okay, so the rescript should, of course, be read at a symbolical level. 
the werewolf represents the patriarchy that suffocates and imprisons women. But he turns out to be the grandmother too, right? So the werewolf sums up both figures, uh, the grandmother and the patriarchy, the men. And now the grandmother. Why would a grandma kill a granddaughter? The grandma stands for the women of the older generation that carry the values of the patriarchy and help perpetrate them. Okay, so the grandma stands for the older women, those who agree with the patriarchy, those who support the patriarchy. So the werewolf and the grandma are one. They work together to support the patriarchal structure from generation to generation. The grandma metaphorically tries to kill the child because she passes on to her the patriarchal ideas about her role and the way she should be and live. These stereotypical ideas imprison and oppress the child. Okay, so that's why the werewolf grandmother wanted to kill the child because she was passing on the values of the, the patriarchy. In the end, it is the child who kills the grandma with the help of the community. The neighbors stand for the community. This is the rite of passage. Killing the older generation women means breaking free from the constraints of gender stereotypes. The child here is nothing like Little Red Riding Hood. The child here is active, resourceful, strong, self-assured, self-conscious, independent, outspoken, resilient. Here too, uh, you know, I could go on. There is no hunter to save her. She saves herself. There is no hunter. There is no man. The community, the neighbors that help her kill the old witch, stand for society that should help women, but doesn't do it very often. In order to free women, we must discard all of the ideas and myths and structures and stereotypes that affect women's development as individuals. These are chains and the chains are embedded in the language, in the culture. Carter argues that as long as the weak, docile girl from the fairy tale is presented as the norm, as long as this weakness is considered normal, women will always be, be viewed as psychologically, physically and emotionally inferior to men. Therefore, it becomes essential for women to unlearn, the opposite of learn, unlearn, the lessons they have internalized. While society must, must free the language from the dominant sexi sexist patriarchal re rhetoric and give prominence to the female point of view. Uh, I want to say something more. The classical ending, which is in fairy tales, which is uh, they lived happily ever after, has become a rather unconvincing ending, too fatalistic, too trusting, too connected to the idea of a couple, right? Two people. This one is better. Now the child uh, lived in her grandma's house. She prospered. The patriarchy is dead. The child herself is the factor in her destiny. She's free and whole, the new woman. She expands, right? And so from passivity to power, as I said before. And now let's move on to, okay, maybe before starting, I should try and um, uh, share in another in another way um, I should try again to share in the other way 
So let's take a break for a second. Can you see? What can you see? The first one. Sì, vediamo la prima. Okay. Is it going on? Sì. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, Eccoci. Okay. Now I'll try with the uh, presentation. Can you see it in presentation mode? Non ancora. And now? The same. No, eh, eh, forse perché, boh, non lo so, della presentazione corrente, della diapositiva corrente, prova um, eh, al, nell'angolo destro in, in basso uh -huh. c'è un piccolo schermo, guarda, vai con, dopo, dopo, Ancora quello. Ah, sì. Ah. sì. Can you see it now? No, non ancora. Forse allora... Uh, should I use uh, una finestra o schermo intero? Um, ma guarda, uh, così vediamo bene... La, la, la tua la modalità presentazione di Meet è corretta, va benissimo dal mio punto di vista, credo che anche gli altri vedano bene. È solo la modalità di presentazione del PowerPoint che è in modalità lavoro, ma alla fine Sonia si vede bene comunque la slide, perciò non, no, non credo ci siano problemi. And now there, there will be problems later because I've got, um, okay, wait. Sì. Eh, se vuoi ce l'abbiamo anche noi, Chiara può aiutarti, può, potrebbe presentare lei se vuoi essere libera, come preferisci. Diciamo che una pausa dall'inglese ci, ci può stare, va bene. Can you understand? Is it difficult? No, benissimo. Sei molto chiara. Ovviamente non riesco a risponderti in inglese, però sei molto chiara. Grazie Sonia, se qualcuno mi vuole aiutare in questo frangente può esprimersi in inglese, io ti parlo in italiano. Sarebbe troppo per me con... 120 persone ci ascoltano. Technology. I hate technology. Sì, sa essere odiosa. Eccoti, perfetta. Eh, ok, beh, perfetta, then... Perfetta. Then I Come? don't know if, if uh, we'll be able to um, to see the, the um, there's a video there's um, something uh... ah okay we'll see right let's go on with Margaret Atwood uh, so from sexism to servitude let's move on with her to hear what she has to say. Actually, she has a lot to say, 
and uh, she says it uh, or writes it uh, really well. I love her, right? Really. This extremely prolific Canadian writer, poetess and climate activist, uh, she's a climate activist uh, too, has been enriching the lives of her readers uh, for a long time. Uh, she's been writing for a really long time. Among other things, she's passionate about dystopias. And as my students uh, know, so am I. <laughs> dystopias focus on one aspect of society and life and carry it to extremes. Uh, the issue is put under a magnifying glass, uh, exaggerated, and in this way, analyzed and exposed. The Handmaid's Tale was published in 1985, okay, the, the novel uh, we're going to be talking about. It has made uh, into a film in 1990, and subsequently reshaped into a TV series uh, in 2017. So there's a TV series about it, uh, but uh, it's it becomes, uh, at the beginning, it's the same as the novel. Then the plot um, becomes really very different. In an interview about the novel, Atwood stated that she wanted to see what would happen if misogynistic attitudes were taken to their logical conclusion that is, to extremes. So she wanted to take misogynistic attitudes to the extremes, okay? The, the ones that already exist in society, she wanted to uh, put them in a, under a magnifying glass. Um, that's uh, what a keen Im imagination did. She imagined a world um, that is experiencing a dramatic fall in fertility rates, right? Due to pollution, nuclear accidents, and various other causes, the issue of reproduction has become vital, okay? Pregnancies are rare. Infertility plagues both men and women, right? It's nearly impossible to have a child. A group of Puritan fundamentalists, so-called Sons of Jacob, overthrows the US government, right? And establishes a totalitarian theocracy called Gilead. Gilead is a place name taken from the Bible. In Gilead, the Bible, the Old Testament, becomes the law. And the law is to be interpreted literally. The first act of the new government is stripping women of their personal freedom and their civil rights. Women can no longer work or study. They're not allowed to read and the little girls will not be taught to read and write. Okay, this looks, you know, this sounds strangely familiar, right? If you think of Afghanistan. Besides the usual features of totalitarian regimes, which are total control, manipulation of language, propaganda, the use of some scapegoat, the Gilead theocracy introduces a new factor, sexual servitude, which I'll explain in, in a minute. Let me tell you more about the structure of this society, Gilead's uh, society. Women are promptly distinguished according to function. So women are distinguished according to function. The wives sit at the top of the so social ladder. They are married uh, to the architects of the regime, the generals uh, and commanders that, that make up the oligarchy, the elite the group, the rules, uh, the country. They are rather powerful within their households. The wives are completely dependent on their husbands. Then there are the martyrs, another category. Um, they belong to the lowest uh, class. Uh, they are simply house servants. Uh, and of course, they are sterile. The aunts, a further group, on the other hand, wield some authority in that they are the teachers, whose task is to indoctrinate the young, fertile women, the handmaids. 
the ants support the values of the patriarchal elite, right? So the ants are a little bit like the grandma in the werewolf. However, everything revolves around the handmaids, right? Like in the title, uh, around the handmaids who have to endure a harsh alienating fate. They are the sexual slaves. Handmaid means assistant, helper. Um, selected because of their certified fertility, most of them have already had a child. The handmaids are moved from elite family to elite family with the only objective of producing children. They are like surrogate mothers with the man of the family, the husband thus functioning as the infertile wives, handmaids, helpers. During the so-called ceremony, the handmaid is ritually raped, abused by the husband in the wife's presence. Uh, of course, the child resulting from the rape belongs to the wife and the husband, not to the handmaid. Reproduction is the handmaid's only assigned purpose in, in life. The rest is nothing. The handmaids are supposed to have no feelings, no past, no memories, no thoughts of their own, no individuality, in one word. In this regime, the bodies of fertile women are so precious they have to be put under control. So remember, in this uh, regime, the um, environmental disasters that men, that humanity has caused, have caused women to be infertile, and men too. Uh, only the bodies of women count, not their minds though, <laughs> not at all, okay, or their personalities. The handmaids are property, they are commodities, in other words, their bodies are objectified. They're simply tools aimed at reproduction, machines to make new human beings. The women literally belong to the men. The main character in the story is actually, actually called June, but in Gilead, she is given the name of Fred, a patronymic meaning of Fred. And so belonging to someone called Fred, the name of her commander. Alfred somehow manages to record her experience as a handmaid, right? That's why the story exists according to the novel uh, frame. Her tapes are subsequently found and studied by historians in 2195, so in the future where when Gilead uh, has long ceased to, to exist, uh, fortunately, you know. Alfred June struggles to preserve her identity, hidden away and kept secret. Uh, preserved, uh, but very seldom expressed, uh, as you can understand. There are plenty of things to say about this fictional regime, but time is a hard master. There's not much time in that it is insufficient right now. <laughs> the Handmaid's Tale undoubtedly, undoubtedly serves as a cautionary tale, a warning, a wake-up call. It says to us, be careful. Among other things, it says to all of us, keep fighting for equality and never rest. Never take anything for granted, as women's bodies might be used as political instruments. Simone de Beauvoir, you know, a French feminist writer, once said, never forget that it only takes a political, economic or religious crisis for women's rights to be called into question. So women's rights are not stable, they are not cemented or well-established. They are ephemeral, evanescent and unstable, right? So we always need to be on our guard. And now let's move on to Warson Chiri.
right? Okay, so however bad the situation might be, for some people, the obstacles are insuperable. The issue is not simply equality, that is long forgotten. Life, survival is at stake, right? Uh, born 1988, a really young Somali poetess based in London, Wasan Chire wrote about a home that becomes most inhospitable, right? So we're going to be uh, listening to uh, home, uh, her poem. This poem we're going to listen to from the voice of the author herself, if it works, shows that the struggle for gender equality is intertwined, uh, is together with additional struggles that can engulf and obscure it. Human rights, in these cases, are suspended. Now, Shire is no doubt a feminist. However, the poem I've chosen goes beyond any gender issue to focus on the tragedy of humans that flee, humans escaping. The global refugee crisis is an inclusive issue. It includes all existing tragedies. It's a real catastrophe. In the poem, it all starts from the idea of home. Home, a rich word full of meaning. Home means comfort, security, love, affection, care, protection, anything we, we can think of which is positive. Home is where the heart is, right? There is a famous uh, proverb idiom. However, there are times when home doesn't want you. Home is ready to kill you and you must escape and look for a new home. This poem includes a collage of multiple voices, a plethora of experiences, a patchwork of suffering the poet collected through talking to refugees in Rome, right? So she came to Italy, listening to their near encounter with death. It is a universal cry for help, for understanding. It's the universal suffering of humans losing their home and together with it, their identity and their dignity. What awaits them is not another home though. It is another hell, right? That's why I wrote uh, from hell to home, from home to hell, from hell to home. Um, it is another hell, an unwelcoming, freezing cold hell, the refugee camp. And then maybe another country. We don't know how hospitable. There is an underlying question in the poem. The question the other humans ask, those who are looking at, at these people who escape, why have you left your home? Why have you come here? What do you want from us? The poem is the answer to the question. It explains the inevitability of leaving home. Because who wouldn't leave home if home had become the mouth of a shark, the barrel of a gun? Who would leave home if it weren't a matter of survival? The rhetorical answer is no one, of course. So we're going to be listening to the poem. I'll give you some context before, before starting. A war has started. People frantically escape. The first and second stanzas describe destruction, fighting, people running and leaving everything behind. Then the journey. They try to reach other countries. The journey is terrible, beyond description. People travel in the stomach of trucks, under trains, in crowded boats. They are beaten, they are abused, they lose their loved ones before their eyes. Then the refugee camp, 
the violence, the waiting, the humiliations. Then the new country, the bigotry, maybe, the racism, the contempt. I'm warning you, the language, the words are really harsh, brutal almost, broken and scattered. They mirror the facts, they convey the pain and the strain. Violence pervades the poem. The imagery is very powerful. The shark, the barrel of a gun. Chiray is reading, okay, so the authoress is reading. Near the end, her voice is broken by emotion. Let's see if it works. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath only tearing up your passport in airport toilets sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back you have to understand no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land no one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages no one spends days and nights in the wall bladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled means something more than journey no one crawls under fences wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one skin would be tough enough to go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggers with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their own country, and now they want to mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back, and maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off, or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces, I want to go home. But home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore. Unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind. Crawl through the desert. Wade through the ocean. Drown. Save. Be hungry. Beg. Forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear. Saying leave. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become. But I know that anywhere is safer than here. So very powerful. Home is personified. It becomes a person. It becomes someone that whispers in your ears, someone that tells you to go away. And the subject, I... Okay, so it wasn't finished, uh, sorry. Uh, and the subject I is small, not capital letter. This is to convey uh, the alienation, the distance to the real self, the loss of identity. The poem is a twisted love letter to a home that has become hostile and at the same time a universal plea for solidarity and understanding. By losing a physical home, these humans have lost a spiritual one as well. However, life is more precious than anything you could be called to undergo. Better to face bigotry, racism, xenophobia, hatred, abuse, 
than to lose life. Survival is more important. I've included this poem to reinforce the point that, that any progress as to gender equality is constantly threatened by any imaginable crisis that may turn up, right? So anything can stop the progress of uh, gender towards gender equality. It's a steep road for how could people care about equality and justice in this tormented world where the issue is merely surviving? I want to conclude on a positive note. Leaving home is horrible, and yet it's a new beginning, a fresh start. There must be some hope, however hidden, the hope for a home. And now, last, but definitely not least, Chimamanda. Chimamanda Ngozi Adikye is a Nigerian writer of fiction and non-fiction, and she possesses a vivacious, charismatic personality. You can see that from, from her face, you see. I'm not going to be talking about the many novels that make her one of the most prominent African writers of the moment, but about one of her inspiring TED Talks. The one she delivered in 2012 that goes by the title, We Should All Be Feminists, and has become iconic, really very famous. I warmly recommend the speech to you. Chimamanda manages to be both hilarious, ironic, and serious. It's a real treat. Through a series of episodes from uh, uh, everyday life, she reflects upon the word feminist, uh, as well as giving us a picture of the deep cultural gap between a boy's and a girl's upbringing in Nigeria. She deals with Nigeria, but actually most of what she says applies to most countries around the world. The assumption is gender become comes with a set of specific expectations. So something is expected uh, from you if you're a girl, something else if you're a boy. Boys are taught and expected to be strong, independent and ambitious. Girls, on the other hand, are brought up to be obedient, not so ambitious, and they are taught to aspire to marriage and never in any way to outshine boys or men, okay? Uh, girls uh, should never overcome boys or men. So boys may expand, enlarge. Girls can only shrink, get smaller. A lot of pressure is put on both sexes. Boys who can't live up to what, what is expected uh, of them, develop fragile egos. Uh, they become insecure if they can't uh, be the way they are prescribed to be. Women who possess ambition and drive are restrained by their families uh, and by communities. So, Chimamanda says, gender expectations are a trap, a real trap. So let's hear an example from her. I'll give you some context. At school, she wanted to become the class monitor. Now, the class monitor is uh, the student who's the, the representative, the head of the class. Okay, And she was very young, like uh, nine years old, eight, year, eight years old. Uh, the leader of the class, okay, the class monitor. But even though she got the highest uh, score in her class test, she could not, her teacher said, be in a position of authority just because she was a girl, you know, as simple as that. Again, like in Wolf, suppressed ambition, wasted talent. Okay, now let's uh, hear from her. Of course, a lot of this was tongue in cheek, but that word feminist is so heavy with baggage, negative baggage. You hate men, you hate bras, you hate African culture, that sort of thing. Now, here's a story from my childhood. 
when I was in primary school, my teacher said at the beginning of term that she would give the class a test, and whoever got the highest score would be the class monitor. Now, class monitor was a big deal. If you were a class monitor, you got to write down the names of noisemakers, <laughs> which was heady enough power on its own. But my teacher would also give you a cane to hold in your hand while you walked around and patrolled the class for noisemakers. Now, of course, you were not actually allowed to use the cane. But it was an exciting prospect for the nine-year-old me. I very much wanted to be the class monitor, and I got the highest score on the test. Then, to my surprise, my teacher said that the monitor had to be a boy. She had forgotten to make that clear earlier because she assumed it was obvious. <laughs> a boy had the second highest score on the test, and he would be monitor. Now, what was even more interesting about this is that the boy was a sweet, gentle soul who had no interest in patrolling the class with the king, <laughs> while I was full of ambition to do so. But I was female, and he was male, and so he became the class monitor. And I've never forgotten that incident. Okay, so she couldn't become the class monitor because she was a girl. <laughs> but, however, man dominance, so the power of men, made sense when physical strength was fundamental for survival, right? When, you, when men had to hunt uh, animals uh, to eat, uh, to survive. Now survival and success go together with intelligence, creativity, innovation, and these qualities belong to both genders, to both men and women. Uh, let's hear from Chimamanda. Let's hear what she says. Of course, a lot of this was tongue in cheek, but that word feminist is so heavy with baggage, negative baggage. <laughs> while you walked around and patrolled the class for noisemakers. For the nine-year-old me, I very much wanted to be the class monitor, and I got the highest score on the test. Then to my surprise, my teacher said that the monitor had to be a boy. To make that clear earlier, because she assumed it was obvious. <laughs> a boy had the second highest score on the test, and he would be monitor. Now, what was even more interesting about this is that the boy was a sweet, gentle soul who had no interest in patrolling the class with the king, while I was full of ambition to do so. But I was female, and he was male, and so he became the class monitor. And I've never forgotten that incident. And the man being paid more because he's a man. So in a literal way, men rule the world. And this made sense a thousand years ago. Because human beings lived then in a world in which physical strength was the most important attribute for survival. The physically stronger person was more likely to lead. And men in general are physically stronger. Of course, there are many exceptions. <laughs> but today we live in a vastly different world. The person more likely to lead is not the physically stronger person. It is the more creative person, the more intelligent person, the more innovative person. And there are no hormones for those attributes. A man is as likely as a woman to be intelligent, to be creative, to be innovative. We have evolved, but it seems to me that our ideas of gender have not evolved. So she says that we have evolved, but our ideas of gender, our gender expectations have not evolved very much. This is clear in the numerous injustices, big and small, in the prejudices that could be defined as everyday sexism. Now let's listen to another episode. I'll give you some context. In a car park, a man helps uh, Chivamanda and her friend park their car. This is a scene we, we can see in our towns as well. Chivamanda gives him a tip, okay, so some extra money. And let's see how the man reacts. 
Okay, now I'll try of course and a lot get... of this was tongue in cheek. We have evolved, but it seems to me that our ideas of gender have not evolved. <laughs> then one evening in Lagos, Louis and I went out with friends. And for people here who are familiar with Lagos, there's that wonderful Lagos fixture, the sprinkling of energetic men who hang around outside establishments and very dramatically help you pack your car. I was impressed with the particular theatrics of the man who found us a parking spot that evening. And so as we were leaving, I decided to give him a tip. I opened my bag, put my hand inside my bag, brought out my money that I had earned from doing my work, and I gave it to the man. And he, this man who was very grateful and very happy, took the money from me, looked across at Louis and said, thank you, sir. <laughs> Louis, Louis looked at me surprised and asked, why is he thanking me? I didn't give him the money. Then I saw realization dawn on Louis' face. The man believed that whatever money I had had ultimately came, had ultimately come from Louis, because Louis is a man. Okay, so the man thanks Chimamanda's friend, a man, not Chimamanda, right? A woman is assumed to be dependent on her man. So <laughs> What do we need for a fairer world, for a better world? We need to raise up boys and girls in the same way, letting go of what gender prescribes. Because gender prescribes how we should be, rather than recognizing how we are. Okay, so gender says to us, you must be like this. But it doesn't recognize what we really are and we usually conform to what society dictates we internalize the rules we become the way people want us to become not who we really want to be our mindset must change our mentality must change after all culture is constantly changing culture does does not make people People make culture, right? So culture does not make people. It's people who make, make culture. And what does it mean to be a feminist? Well, Chimamanda finally clears the word from negative connotations. A feminist is not an unmarried woman who hates men and doesn't wear bras. A feminist is anyone, be it a man or a woman, uh, be it a man or a woman who believes in the political, economic and social equality of the sexes, as we said at the beginning. So, no antagonizing of men, but cooperation instead. We need to work together because the metamorphosis has not occurred, not completely, not yet. And now let us go back to the title of this lesson. We need to break out and break free from the constraints of fixed, stereotyped identities in order to embrace the complexities of simply being human. One word, human. In Chimamanda's words, society should acknowledge the full humanity of women because this is what is lacking. I want to close the circle by reassuring Virginia Woolf that now female and feminist fiction are alive and well. Women are no longer anonymous, nameless and voiceless. Women write, women speak up, women live. And as Angela Carter says, we will prosper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leonardo, number one, for patience and kindness. 
And a special thank you to my students who teach me something or rather every day. Spero di non avervi annoiato. Ci hai lasciato senza parole, grazie. Ti fingiamo di applaudirti, ecco, Fabio che applaude, ma insomma. Ci stringiamo nell'applauso, anche se eh, ovviamente dobbiamo rimanere... Eh, Thank you for your patience. For your patience. You were really very patient listening to me. Intanto eh, approfitto per... Um, eh, prendendo spunto da una delle ultime affermazioni che hai fatto riguardo alla cultura che condiziona gli uomini o gli uomini che condizionano la cultura... Eh, eh, perché eh, vi eh, ricordo, approfitto per eh, ricordarvi che l'ultimo eh, degli appuntamenti dedicati eh, ai ragazzi eh, si terrà il 3 marzo e eh, affronterà il tema eh, from to dal punto di vista eh, e giuridico e eh, delle scienze umane con, eh, e quindi credo anche sociologico eh, e antropologico, non so ancora ancora perché eh, ovviamente mh, siamo eh, in attesa con il professor Adamo Marcantonio che è qui con noi eh, oggi pomeriggio che quindi salutiamo e a cui eh, lanciamo il prossimo testimone.